Hi everybody and uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the first uh, educational webinar uh, organized by the International League uh, Against Epilepsy jointly by the uh, East Mediterranean region and African region. And today uh, we have in the first topic uh, a conference about uh, vitamin B6 uh, dependent epilepsy and we are uh, happy to have with us uh, Professor uh, Majdi Kara, uh, Professor of Pediatric Neurology, working as a senior in uh, Pediatric Neurology in Tripoli Child Hospital. Uh, he is also uh, the Secretary General of the Libyan Epilepsy Society and uh, a member of the group uh, working uh, on uh, the guidelines uh, uh, of uh, peridoxin dependent epilepsy uh, published uh, recently in, uh, I think, November uh, 2020. So, uh, welcome, uh, Dr. Kara. And uh, you have uh, 14 minutes uh, to present your conference. And after, we move to the questions and uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Fatma, for the introduction. I'll start with my uh, presentation. Just one minute. Can you see Fatma, the, um, my sharing or not? Not yet. Not yet, okay. Just hold on. It's okay. Can you see it now? Yes, it's okay. Okay. Just put uh, full screen. Yeah, I'm trying to see the full screen. Actually, it's um, obs obscured. Share. I don't know how to make full screen. If you if you move to the top where it says slideshow, at the very top. Yes. Okay. There we go. Yeah, click into slide just up. Where the writing is at the top. Yes, Siobhan. Can you see tr transitions? Can you see transitions? Transitions, yes. Over now, and you see to the right, can you see slideshow? Slideshow. No, it's not uh, clear. If you move your cursor up to the very top and move it over, over to the, yeah, keep moving. And again, over and again, and just, oh, you got it. Uh, show, slideshow, okay. Yeah. And if we go from beginning there. Here. This should work. Pick that. Yeah. Is that okay, the, yeah? Yeah, we can see that very okay. clearly. Uh, I'm sorry for the delay. Uh, these are my dis uh, disclosures. I have nothing specifically to disclose. I start uh, my lecture with the vitamin B6 metabolism. Um, just hold on. Uh, we start with the B6 metabolism as uh, it's shown here in this slide, uh, taking pyridoxin B6 from the diet, started from the diet, then would be absorbed through intestine by the intestinal phosphatase, and it goes to the hepatic circulation. In the hepatic circulation, the final uh, pathway is the pyridoxin phosphate. This is the active form of pyridoxin. Uh, 
from the hepatic uh, circulation, it will go to the brain and it will be uh, uh, dephosphorylated and then phosphorylated in the brain and forms the active form in the brain cells, the pyridoxal phosphate. The next slide is, uh, it's about uh, genetic disorders affecting vitamin B6 metabolism, leading to vitamin B6 dependent epilepsy. There are a lot of genetic disorders which lead to this uh, vitamin B6 dependent epilepsy. Um, the most common is number one, uh, which is caused by the ALDH7A1 mutation. Uh, our talk would be mainly on this uh, topic the other, to the other topics are less common and needs a little uh, more lectures to cover. The other topics caused by uh, pyridoxine phosphate oxidase deficiency, PNOP, uh, this is leading to a decrease in the synthesis of the active form of B6, which is pyridoxal phosphate. The third one is pyridoxal phosphate homostasis protein uh, deficiency. Uh, this is due to a mutation and the paradoxal phosphate binding protein gene. Uh, this protein protects the paradoxal phosphate from reacting with the other coenzymes. So it's very important the, in the hemostasis of the paradoxal phosphate. The fourth is hypophosphatasia. In some cases in the severe form where there is a low alkaline phosphatase, especially the isoenzyme uh, present in the intestine, this will lead to defect in the absorption of the uh, phosphorylated uh, B6 to unphosphorylated 4. Finally, the uh, fifth one is the hyperprolinemia type 2. This also can occur due to a gene mutation leading to a, a deficiency in the uh, pyrrolin 5 carboxylate this compound will react with the active form of B6, which is pyridoxal phosphate, and form condensations. It's the same mechanism as the first one mentioned about the ALDH7A1 mutation. So uh, my next talk would be mainly on uh, type, the first one, the ALDH7A1 mutation. But yeah. Uh, Paradox-independent epilepsy caused by mutation in the ALDH7A1 gene, which encodes the alpha amino adipoxemia aldehyde dehydrogenase. This uh, uh, happens in the lysine catabolic pathway. The result is that there will be accumulation of al alpha amino adipoxemia aldehyde and piperidine 6 carboxylate uh, compound. The, the last compound, the piperidine 6 carboxylate, this is the main compound which will uh, inactivate the active form of pyridoxine uh, B6, which is pyridoxal phosphate. So it's forming a, a condensation and make the pyridoxal phosphate is inactive. So the th therapeutic strategy of pyridoxine supplementation is to overcome the secondary depletion of uh, pyridoxal phosphate. So the more pyridoxine you give, the more you get of pyridoxal phosphate amount. So it, it will overcome the condensation by this uh, uh, piperidine 6 carboxylate compound. Uh, pyridoxal phosphate is the cofactor for over 100 uh, enzymes which catalyze reactions in the body, including many involving the synthesis uh, or catabolism of neurotransmitters. This is, um, uh, this slide uh, talks about the lysine degradation and it's very important to understand B6 metabolism is you have to, to know the lysine degradation. There are two pathways of lysine degradation. Uh, the first is sacropene uh, uh, pathway, and the other one is called the pipe colic acid pathway. As you see here, the, uh, the, 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 the defect is uh, in this uh, reaction where 
the uh, alpha amino adipoxemia aldehyde dehydrogenase will be deficient. This lead to accumulation of this compound alpha amino adipoxemia aldehyde, and this will be transformed to the other compound called piperidine 6 carboxylate. So as you could see this red circle over here, that the compound piperidine 6 carboxylate will condensate and react with pyridoxal phosphate and make condensation. So the main uh, problem in um, ALDH7A1 gene uh, defect is the, uh, the main problem is the accumulation of this compound, piperidine 6 carboxylate, which will react with the uh, active form of pyridoxin, uh, pyridoxal phosphate, and make condensation and make pyridoxal phosphate is unavailable uh, for the reaction. This is the same uh, schematic uh, um, scheme that, as the previous one, just it shows more things. Uh, just it shows that the sacropene pathways is the major pathway of lysine degradation, the amino acid here. Uh, also, it shows that this new compound called 6 oxo pipecolate, uh, this compound is elevated uh, through the uh, reaction of uh, piperidine 6 carboxylate. This compound recently, the last year, has been uh, suggested to be probably the a new biomarker for pyridoxine dependent epilepsy. Uh, why it's a, a good, it is a good marker than the other ones uh, used to be the alpha amino aldehyde and the piperidine 6 carboxylate because it is more stable in the room temperature. Pyridoxine dependent epilepsy is often characterized as a treatment refractory epileptic encephalopathy with dramatic clinical or EEG improvement after pyridoxine supplementation. Patients achieve adequate seizure control with pyridoxine alone. However, um, 60, 60 uh, around, uh, sorry, around 75% of individuals treated with B6 monotherapy uh, having significant intellectual disabilities and developmental delay. So in spite of giving pyridoxine, 75% uh, of patients will have intellectual disability. So the, here again, uh, the sacropin, as we showed before early pathway is the major route of lysine degradation rather than pyrocholic acid pathway. This supports the inhibition of sacropene pathways for the treatment of the new treatment options for ALDH7A1 mutation. Uh, this will show it later on in the next few slides. Uh, Pyridoxine dependent epilepsy is a rare disease with estimated incidence of around 65,000 live births. Pyridoxine dependent epilepsy is pan ethnic and 90% of the cases will have biallelic mutation in the ALDH7A1. A paradoxin dependent epilepsy is characterized by an epileptic encephalopathy, varying degree of intellectual disability or developmental delay, rarely may present with seizures outside the uh, uh, neonatal period. We come here to the investigations in the pediatric uh, in the um, pyridoxine dependent epilepsy in due to ALDH7A1. Uh, usually we do urine or plasma. And usually uh, myself, we sent here through urine. Uh, there will be elevation of the uh, alpha amino adipoxemia aldehyde and piperidine 6 carboxylate and pipe colic acids. These the three metabolites will be increased in the urine and in plasma, and it's used to be as a, a marker for the disease. Uh, although uh, uh, pipe colic acid can be normal in some cases. So the most important one we use so far is the alpha amino adipoxemia aldehyde and piperidine 6 carboxylate in neuron. If it's elevated, that will support the diagnosis. Uh, 
Uh, number five, six oxo pipe collate. This is, as I mentioned before, this, this is a new novel biomarker. Uh, it is stable at a room te temperature up to 40 days and can be quantified using current newborn screening technique. Lastly, uh, you need to, uh, to prove is by doing the um, LDH7A1 gene. Uh, differential diagnosis, urinary uh, alpha amino semialdehyde and pepidine 6 carboxylate excretion is elevated. It is found to be elevated in patients with mupolydinum cofactor deficiency and isolated sulfite oxidase deficiency. By accumulating mutabites, uh, these uh, leading to uh, uh, the effect in the alpha amino semialdehyde dehydration uh, enzyme leading to its inhibition. So genetic testing of ALDH7A1 should be performed. We come to the therapy in, in pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy due to ALDH7A1, uh, what's called a triple therapy recently. Uh, many patients achieve adequate seizure control with pyridoxine alone. However, 75% of these patients uh, treated with pyridoxine monotherapy will have significant intellectual disability and developmental delay. The degree of intellectual disability does not correlate with early age of diagnosis or seizure or early seizure control. This suggesting that the cognitive impairment is not solely due to result of the epilepsy itself, but to accumulation of these uh, products, the alpha amino adipic semialdehyde peperidine 6 carboxylate and the uh, 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 pipe colic acid. Uh, recent treatment, uh, treatment have attempted to reduce the accumulation of the compound alpha amino adipic semialdehyde and peperidine 6 carboxylate through uh, a lysine restricted diet. So by restricting the lysine, this will help to support the pyridoxin treatment. Uh, the other one is the, uh, uh, the use of L-arginine by uh, competitive inhibition of the lysine transporter across the cell membrane. This shared transporter system is uh, uh, shared by the L-arginine. Uh, this uh, graph uh, shows that the uh, before treatment and then after biodexin treatment and after triple treatment, you could see the reduction of the alpha amino adipic semialdehyde and the uh, pipe uh, piperidine uh, six carboxylate and pipe colic acid. So the using using the triple therapy will markedly reduce the uh, urine and plasma uh, compounds. Pyridoxine uh, treatment requirements. In the first description by Hunt in 1954, a complete seizure control for 21 month old child would, was uh, done by giving him only two milligrams of B6 per day. Over the ensuing years, the dose of B6 used to treat pyridoxine dependent epilepsy gradually increased. Uh, one, uh, a 10 year old child with pyridoxine dependent epilepsy, which has uh, uh, a low school performance uh, and deteriorating. So uh, his intelligence questions was low and the B6 dose was increased from 50 to 150. This showed subsequently a good improvement in his uh, IQ. Subsequent testing of five other cases suggests that some uh, in the some children the IQ will increase if you increase the dose of uh, B6 from five milligram per kg per day to 15 milligram per kg per day, but there was no further uh, improvement in the IQ after increasing the dose above 15 milligram uh, per kg per day. And experimental animals, those of biodoxin as high as uh, 50 milligram per kg per day can cause 
ataxia and peripheral neuropathy and muscle weakness. So in humans, uh, peripheral neuropathy can occur if you give a higher dose of P6. This didn't, hasn't been documented in cases where the uh, dose is below 200 milligrams, but most of the documented cases, these people were taking more than 1,000 milligram per kg per day. Uh, per day. Uh, a total dose, especially this has uh, in, been in an adults. Although some, uh, some articles show that actually up to 500 milligram per day of B6 can cause uh, peripheral neuropathy. So pyridoxine treatment requirement usually is between 10 and 30 milligrams per kg per day in the neonatal period uh, to a maximum dose of 200 milligrams. And for adults, they recommend uh, up to 500 milligram per day. In case uh, pyridoxine treatment in an emergency, in times of seizure relapse during febrile illness, a treatment with pyridoxine may be doubled up to a maximum of 60 milligram per kg per day in children and 500 milligram per day in adults for up to three days. Also, uh, in time of illness, you need to ensure adequate caloric intake to prevent catabolism of endogenous uh, protein and reduce uh, protein intake. We come to the lysine uh, uh, amino acids in milk. The addition of lysine-free formula with, uh, with the goal to maintain plasma lysine levels between 60 and 100 micromole per liter. The, the lysine content of breast milk uh, in the natal period is between 68 and 86 milligrams per 100 ml, while in the formula milk is almost doubled. So uh, usually they recommend using a breast milk. Uh, recent results suggest that for the triple therapy, you should use around between 200 and 600 milligrams per kg per day of L-arginine and a lysine intake restriction to a dietary reference intake according to the age. This uh, needed to reduce the enterolysine uh, uptake and the systemic lysine oxidation. And also you need to monitor the amino acids. The protein, protein intake, the lysine-free amino acid formula must be used to provide additional protein intake to meet the protein needs uh, and to, to provide the micronutrients. The aim is to achieve uh, nearly 130% of the daily recommended uh, protein intake for, for the total protein, especially for a growing child. Uh, in contrast to glutaric acid urea type 1, tryptophan restriction is not indicated in the management of pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy. As you know, uh, the, the formula, the same formula used in, glutamic, the, in uh, glutaric acid urea type 1 is the same formula used for pyridoxine dependent epilepsy, except that uh, you need probably to add some tryptophan because a lot of formulas have restriction in tryptophan, which is important uh, for glut uh, glutaric acid urea type 1. If, uh, uh, if a lysine free formula is not well tolerated, lysine reduction may be achieved by reducing total natural protein to the lower. Uh, recommended dose of protein, daily protein, uh, so because the the uh, I mean the lysine-free formula, the the taste, uh, a lot of children they uh, refuse to take it, and and in, in, in that case, probably you might need to use uh, just a reduction in the protein plus the arginine supplements. Mothers with, uh, of neonates and infants with pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy should be encouraged to continue breastfeeding since the average lysine content of breast milk in the natal period is almost half of the formula milk. Lysine content in food. Uh, lysine content varies considerably in different proteins, like in cereals, fruits, and vegetables. Usually, the lysine content is around between 2 and 4% for the total protein. 
uh, whereas in animal protein, usually it's less, uh, it's more rich in lysine up to 8% in beef and chicken uh, and raw uh, and, and cow's milk and 9% in fish. So the actually uh, daily lysine intake uh, um, uh, measurement should less well controlled by a calculation of the total protein intake. Uh, lys uh, the, then lysine intake. Lysine restriction is usually preferred to protein restriction, especially during the first two years of life where there is an ongoing myelination of the brain. Uh, this uh, graph shows uh, the uh, alpha amino adipic semialdehyde and plasma bicolic acid reduction after starting lysine restricted diet. So this is the level before starting the lysine restricted diet. Uh, that's pyridoxine therapy alone. And this is after uh, starting lysine restricted diet. You can see mark the reduction in this uh, alpha amino adipic semialdehyde and plasma bicolic acid. Also, this uh, similar uh, graph would show before uh, starting lysine restriction diet at the baritux and tori alone and after, and it show marked de uh, decrease in the alpha amino adipic semial diet, pipe colic acid, and uh, pepridine 6 carboxylate. Uh, this graph uh, will show the alpha amino adipic semial diet reduction after start adding L arginine in one patient. And as you could see, uh, the drop of algerine L, L, uh, of the alpha amino adipic semialdehyde over the time referred to the, this is the normal reference range. Going to guidelines development history, uh, Pyodex Independent Epilepsy Consortium was established in 2010. Uh, the initial set of recommendations for the diagnosis treatment and follow-up of pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy due to ALDH7A1 was uh, published in 2011. Treatment recommendations were updated in 2014, include the use of lysine restriction diet. Uh, In-person meeting was uh, moderated on September the 2nd, 2019 in Amsterdam, uh, where there is two uh, survey uh, sent through an email. The two survey results on uh, 30 statements were published by the guidelines development group, including uh, representations from 29 institutions across Africa, Australia, Europe, North America, and South America. Uh, this is published in a uh, journal of Metabolic Inherited Diseases on the 13th November 2020. You can refer to this article for the new guidelines development. And uh, thank you for your uh, listening for this a uh, little bit complicated uh, topic. Thank you, Dr. Kara, for this uh, presentation. So uh, this now, uh, there is no question. Uh, but I have uh, some uh, comment. So uh, uh, in, your in your practice, uh, uh, pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy is uh, an underdiagnosis uh, epileptic encephalopathy. Uh, so uh, in your experience, uh, how much cases have you uh, uh, a confirmed uh, diagnosis uh, per year? Um. Uh, Figure-wise, it's very difficult, Fatma, to say, but it's, uh, uh, I would say every two years, maybe we might see one case. The problem is a lot of them are probably misdiagnosed and they might die in a, a peripheral hospital. Um, uh, so um, I have a total uh, for the last uh, 20 years, um, Probably around, I have seen, I would say, 10 cases. Okay. Yes, in our hospital also, we have uh, uh, in uh, 10 years, I think, uh, uh, 14, 40 patients, 14 patients confirmed 14. Uh, yes, mm. uh, genetically. 
um, and uh, we have uh, uh, um, uh, a founder uh, mutation in in the region of uh, in our region in Sfax uh, region. So, right. Yeah. Uh, regarding we... the gene uh, confirmation, only we recently started uh, gene confirmation. I have uh, two cases. Uh, gene confirmed, but the others we were depending mainly on the uh, biomarkers, the alpha amino, the aldehyde, and the pipe carboxylic, uh, five, six carboxylate. Six. Uh, but because the, the patients were unable to afford uh, the, the price of the genetic uh, diagnosis. Uh, but last year there was a, it was the uh, government supported the uh, confirming the diagnosis. So we were doing it freely. Yes. Um, there is a question. Uh, what seizure types, uh, what seizure phenotypes are associated with uh, periodixin-dependent uh, epilepsy? Um, usually in neonatal periods, um, they are, most of the seizures are brief and uh, probably multifocal. I, I myself, uh, I, I don't work in the neonates. The people in the neonates, they refer patients to me. Now, uh, uh, as I said, you can have many types of seizures. You can even have like a spasm like uh, uh, in some of the pyridex and the uh, seizures. Uh, you can get multifocal or focal uh, uh, seizures. But I think there is no specific type of seizures related. You can say from it uh, phenotypically, this is a seizure related to P6 specifically. Yes, you can have, yes, you can have also a myoclonic uh, seizure, clonic or, uh, or tonic seizure. Yes, for our patient, you have uh, uh, a different uh, phenotypes in, uh, in the same uh, patient. Um, yes. Uh, th there is a question uh, from uh, Hannah Gjan. Um, uh, neonatal screen is uh, already for uh, periodoxin dependent epilepsy and metabolite. Uh, I think the question is not co completely mentioned. We, we, we mentioned, I think, in the lecture that uh, uh, at the present, uh, the most uh, biomarker we use for a screen is uh, alpha amino adipic semialdehyde and pepridine 6 carboxylate. For the other new marker, it hasn't been established yet. Uh, in the labs of uh, to be used as a screen. But it is, uh, there is this new novel marker, the uh, uh, six uh, pipe, co pipe uh, collate Ecoli. is, uh, it's more uh, stable and can be used as a screening in the newborn screening. Yes. Uh, in our practice, uh, the, the metabolic screening is, uh, is uh, complicated. So uh, we do the, the, the test with the uh, paradoxin uh, uh, treatment. And if we have uh, a well response uh, in, in patient with, uh, with severe epilepsy, so we do the, the genetic uh, testing for a patient. I think uh, it is uh, uh, more easy uh, than the, the metabolic screening. I agree, uh, I agree Fabna, that uh... For every patient who uh, resists uh, the uh, antiepileptic drugs after using phenobarb and phenytoin, most of the neonatal uh, units, they will add P6. Yes. And if it's improved, then you can check uh, the urine for alpha amino adipoxymaldehyde. And because these, uh, these markers stay in spite of giving pyridoxin, uh, the pyridoxin will probably reduce up to 50% of uh, these, these markers. So still patients on B6, I have patients on B6 and they are still positive for, for the markers. So the markers doesn't go with paradoxin uh, treatment. Yes. Uh, there is a question, is there uh, a specific EEG features for B6 deficiency? Uh, I think there isn't specific features. Most of uh, uh, the severe uh, form of seizures they neonatal they present with best suppression uh, pattern uh, as far as I know. Yes. I don't yes, know yeah. if you have anything to add, Fatma. Uh, in, in the major uh, cases, we have also uh, 
birth suppressions. Yes. And sometimes uh, multiple focal uh, spikes, uh, uh, but in the majority of cases, yes, uh, they have uh, a birth suppression. Uh, another question, is there uh, an interest to monitor markers under treatment to determine the, the, prog uh, the prognosis? Yes, uh, 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 probably to monitor the, uh, your treatment regarding the dose of lysine restriction and the L-arginine. The more you give L-arginine, the more the, the, uh, the effect on the markers it will reduce, but to a, to a certain limit. So uh, the lysine restriction and the um, L-arginine and paradoxin all together will let, tell you how much the, uh, your markers before treatment and after treatment and during treatment if you increase the dose. Because the dose is really, a, it's a range. Like for L-arginine, you can give between 200 to 400, uh, even up to 600 milligrams per kg per day like what happens in urea cycle defect. You give very high dose of L-arginine. So uh, it depends on your dose. And uh, if, the, if you think that pre-treatment and after treatment the same, so your treatment is low, probably you might need to increase to the upper limit of normal uh, uh, lysine restriction and plus the uh, L-arginine. Uh, and uh, in, in practice, uh, there are uh, a contradictory uh, data about the, the real dose of uh, vitamin B6. So um, I think it is yes. not necessary to increase up to... Uh, uh, well, as I mentioned before, that uh, the B6 uh, uh, in the first uh, pre uh, description by Hunt he used only two milligrams per, per day of B6, which was able to control the seizures. Uh, uh, in the old days, um, all my patients, uh, we, uh, we used to give them only 40 milligram per day, per day only a single dose. Okay. As I mentioned, they found that the, I, uh, the, the small dose will not be enough to overcome the uh, formation or the condensation of the paradoxal phosphate. So if you increase your paradoxin, you still try to overcome the uh, condensation of paradoxal phosphate with the uh, peptidine 6 carboxylate. They found that up to, uh, uh, instead of giving a small dose, you can give up to uh, 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 15 milligram per kg per day, you, uh, uh, your IQ will be improved, but after that, it will not be improved. So a lot of people, they use 15 milligrams per kg per day. Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question, what is the uh, proper monitoring uh, way to assess the response to treatment? I think it is uh, the same Already question. mentioned before, I think, yes. the markers, yeah. Uh, do we need screening uh, by another kind in the family when uh, is detected uh, B1? Uh, if, if, if the family, they have one person affected one with B6. Yes. yes, well, well, well uh, when the mother is uh, pregnant, yeah, uh, usually I usually advise them to start B6 uh, blindly, presuming that the child will be affected. And uh, uh, I have um, two, uh, uh, two families where the mother uh, started to take B6 from the second trimester till delivery. And after delivery, we give the patient uh, the baby uh, B6. Yes. And then we send for urine to confirm if there is uh, markers or not. So if it's, there is no markers, we stop B6. If there is markers, then just we continue. Yes. Um, the next question, uh, should, we, uh, should we monitor uh, amino acids when uh, arginine and restricted lysine diet are prescribed? Definitely, yes. Okay, the next question, uh, en français. 
euh, intérêt d'associer l'acide folinique, durée du traitement. Uh, should we uh, give also the folinic, folic acid and uh, what dose and uh, what, what duration the folic acid folic? Uh, uh, fo folic acid or folinic acid? I think folinic, uh, she folinic said folic, acid. but I think folinic uh, acid. Yeah, I, I didn't find any, uh, there are some articles regarding founding that the folinic acid responsive seizure Uh, it used to be called folinic acid responsive seizure, but I think all they are related to B6. So I don't think so. Uh, as far as I know, even the guidelines, there is no mention about giving folinic acid or folic acid to patients uh, with pyridox independent epilepsy. I think in some paper, there is a, a, a proposal to give the folinic acid because uh, uh, genetically, uh, um, uh, there are. Uh, um, The uh, response to acid folinic is considered as uh, an allelic form of uh, uh, paradox independent epilepsy. Yeah, there are some Africa. articles, but yes. there isn't enough data about that, really. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, the next question, uh, are there MRI changes uh, in this condition? Yes, there are uh, some MRI changes. Uh, most common will be Uh, the corpus callosum hypoplasia uh, and some uh, cortical abnormalities. Uh, it does have, uh, but it's not in every uh, patient. Yes, they can have. Depends also... probably on the gene mutation type and the, the mainly and severity. Yes, uh, in our uh, experience, we we have in some patient. Uh, uh, hypoplasic uh, corpus callosum or. Uh, Cerebellum, but um, we don't know why. Perhaps uh, because uh, the genetic uh, uh, etiology. Okay. The next question: uh, interest of dosing biomarkers in uh, cerebral uh, fluid. Uh, I didn't understand. What, what? What's again the question? What is the interest of dosing biomarker in uh, uh, cerebral uh, fluid? No, I didn't I understand think. what that uh, exactly means, uh, Fatma. Uh, I think uh, uh, if we dose the biomarkers uh, only in, uh, in the urine or in other uh, biological uh, fluid, Fluid. What's fluid means? I don't know what's the word um, fluid. I think um, the CSF. The CS, mm -hmm. uh, CSF? CSF. The biomarks in CSF. In CSF. I think uh, um, uh, there are changes in the CSF, but nobody is doing CSF. I think, I believe once you have uh, markers, uh, regarding the urine and plasma, it's, it's, uh, it is in, enough uh, to submit a CSF analysis. Usually there are some changes in the CSF. I don't know, I don't remember them. Uh, also, maybe the neurotransmitters will be affected as well. Indirectly, so it is not uh, yes, indirect, a biomarker yes. for uh, B6. Uh, another question, uh, is there a risk to have a negative neonatal screening in the mother? Uh, if, if the mother had uh, been treated with B6 during pregnancy, there is a risk to have a negative neonatal screening. Uh, no, uh, uh, as I mentioned, I have two families, two ladies, I asked them to take B6 from the second trimester. And after delivery, we checked the biomarkers and they came positive in spite of treatment before and after delivery. So the biomarkers, they don't disappear completely. The maximum you can re, uh, make them down up to 80% maybe. And the last question is about uh, the function, uh, lumbar function, is normal in uh, B6 deficiency. 
is the same question about uh, biomarker. The biomarker, yeah, the biomarker, there are biomarkers which are present in plasma, urine, and CSF. But nobody use, once uh, it's easy to have a urine or a plasma rather than doing a lumbar puncture. Yes. Uh, another question. Uh... Is it appropriate to consider this, con uh, this condition in older children or adolescent with normal previous development and cognitive who now have uh, resistant uh, epilepsy? Yes, uh, most, more than 90% of cases of, with uh, biodex independent epilepsy happens during neonatal period. But there are a lot of reports uh, mentioning that uh, cases, uh, they happen after the infancy. And probably, uh, especially in cases where you need to treat, uh, where are they resistant to anti-epileptic drugs, you might need to, to try B6 in case of resistant. Like uh, case of resistant to drugs, also you need to, to exclude GLUT1 deficiency. So you need to really to screen for other many many conditions, including the species for uh, 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 epilepsy resistant to anti-epileptic drugs. So there is no other question, uh, but uh, uh, I have one comment. Uh, uh, in our experience, uh, our patients are treated uh, only by uh, vitamin B6. We don't use uh, 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 lysine restricted uh, diet uh, and not uh, uh, L-arginine supplementation. So, um, is it uh, really a need to to use uh, the diet, the specific diet? I, I, we used to be the same, uh, Fatma, until, until recently, especially when I joined the uh, consortium for the PDAF. Uh, it's as as I mentioned before. Pyridoxine alone, 75% of patients, they will have low IQ. I, all my patients having now low IQ because we didn't start the triple therapy. So only we started recently and I don't, want, I don't know, maybe it's a bit late, but all the documented data mentioning that definitely the IQ will improve with the triple therapy. There is no doubt the all the, the markers of alpha amino adipic semi aldehyde and the peptidine sicarboxylate will go down with adding L arginine and uh, lysine restricted diet. Uh, there is another question Is there a genetic and phenotype correlation that can explain the, the age of onset? So far, not. I think, as far as I know, there is no correlation between phenotype and genotype. Yes. Uh, there is no other question. Uh, for, uh, for what does of L arginine? Another question about the L arginine. L arginine is a compound, uh, amino acid compound, which compete with lysine. So it reduced the lysine, the lysine. Uh, when you take it with the, uh, in the protein and, and uridine. So uh, 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 arginine will compete with lysine and prevent it from its absorption. So it's a, a way, even some people, they now, they think you might not use uh, lysine restriction diet. You just low, uh, use a low protein diet and plus arginine will be enough. But uh, I think still further data needed, but uh, definitely uh, the L-arginine is uh, an important uh, in the triple therapy. And at what dose? From 200 to up to, uh, from 200 to 400 milligram per kg per day. Per day. Mm. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think, thank you, Fatma. Uh, there is no other question. It is okay, uh, uh, very interesting. I don't know. Shuvan will be showing up. Okay. Um, yes, we can. We can move to the next presentation. So, if there's no further questions. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you for the uh, presentation. It gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Sam, who's a child neurologist based in Nairobi, Kenya. 
He's a senior lecturer at the School of Medicine at Kenyatta University and a member of the Faculty for Child Neurology Fellowship Program in Kenya. He's also a visiting consultant at Gertrude's Children's Hospital in Nairobi, Kenya. He has implemented an epilepsy outreach program for rural communities through a network of primary healthcare centers in Kenya. His research interests include infectious encephalopathies, sickle cell disease, epilepsy, and health system solutions for underserved settings. He's earned his doctorate from the University of Amsterdam in 2012 on work on seizures and cerebral hemodynamics in childhood encephalopathies. He's received multiple awards, including the ICNET Sheila Wallace Award, the Academy of American, the American Academy of Neurology International Scholarship Award, and the Child Neurology Society Bernard de Souza Award. I know Sam personally, and I can assure you that he's a passionate teacher, an enthusiastic mentor to his junior colleagues, and a great pediatric neurologist and a person. He'll be speaking now on paroxysmal non-epileptic seizures. Over to you, Sam. For, for some reason, once I've shared, I, I, I lose control uh, uh, to unmute myself. So it's a pleasure. Thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, I had uh, indicated to Dr. Kara that uh, after his uh, uh, very interesting presentation, then I can get away with anything. Uh, I, I appreciate it's very late uh, in the day for everyone. Uh, and uh, this is going to be soft uh, and hopefully it will be worth your time. Uh, I know that quite uh, a lot of team members on the call are pretty experienced uh, and, and uh, uh, actually have no issue with this particular topic. Uh, so feel free to chip in and contribute. So I hope it will be as interactive as possible uh, and uh, we can enjoy ourselves uh, with that. But this is a, a, a topic that I, I have challenges with. Uh, in truth, uh, distinguishing between uh, epileptic and non-epileptic seizures, uh, uh, even for the most uh, experienced of, uh, of individuals, you still see uh, once in a while you don't get it right because uh, a lot of what we rely on uh, essentially depends on uh, uh, clinical assessments uh, and the narration or, or history uh, from uh, parents or guardians uh, or the people who are next to this individual. So I'll start with uh, uh, essentially uh, exploring the, the definition of seizures by International League Against Epilepsy. Uh, and um, clearly there's an attempt, uh, or rather uh, there's a distinction between an epileptic seizure and the general term seizure. And, and the Eliya definition is that an epileptic seizure is a transient occurrence of signs and or symptoms due to abnormal, uh, excessive or synchronous neural, neuronal activity in the brain. So the brain has to be involved in epileptic seizure. While Caesar as a general term uh, essentially uh, is derived from the Greek word meaning to, to seize or to take hold. And it means a variety of things uh, uh, to mean uh, any uh, physical or psychological sided event, some of them uh, pathological, some not, but of course that look like epileptic seizures uh, in, in some ways. Uh, and uh, it's important that this distinction is made according to the International League Against Epilepsy because there is significant misdiagnosis of epileptic seizures. And like most things in nature, uh, you know, you think you see what it is and it's actually not what it is. Uh, so uh, there are lots of things that look like epileptic seizures. Uh, it's a common uh, cause of misdiagnosis. And I just want to explore a couple of uh, studies. Uh, this, this uh, uh, in a study of a, 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 a Fitz, Spain's and Funny Towns clinic in the UK, uh, uh, out of 380 children, uh, only 23% uh, who are thought to have had epilepsy actually had epilepsy. The rest uh, had uh, non-epileptic uh, uh, seizures, with the majority being uh, syncope and uh, reflex uh, anoxic seizures, and then a whole lot of other uh, movement uh, observations uh, that were seen in these uh, children. 
this uh, was a retrospective study in Denmark. Uh, uh, and again, it notes very significant occurrence of uh, uh, misdiagnosis of epileptic seizures. Uh, and out of 87 children, uh, or rather out of uh, 223 children who were thought to actually have epilepsy, uh, about 87 uh, of them did not. And they also had a variety of, of, of events. Uh, and you can see the breakdown on table three, uh, the most commonly staring episodes, which range from mental retardation to autism to learning disorders. Then you, you see uh, quite a bit of uh, psychogenic non-epileptic seizures. Uh, and uh, I think it's important to note that most of these kids were actually on, uh, on treatment uh, and uh, they had undergone an EEG that showed uh, abnormalities. And, and, you know, in our setting, that's really uh, usually used a lot to justify uh, treatment. So uh, I take it further and we have a population study uh, also uh, of about 214 individuals with a pri primary diagnosis of epilepsy, who 23% uh, of which were found to actually not have seizures. And uh, further in a retrospective analysis of, uh, of, of individuals who were referred to a tertiary center with refractory epilepsy, actually uh, quite a huge majority of them were found not to have seizures. Uh, it's approximated that about uh, a third of, of, of people uh, with, or rather thought to have epilepsy do not actually have uh, epilepsy. So it's, it's a pretty common, and you can see from these studies that uh, those proportions are sort of around there. Uh, in the Bible, uh, seizures uh, are mentioned a couple of times, or conversions are mentioned a couple of times. In the New Testament, up to seven times. Uh, I look uh, at the descriptions and they are pretty explicit, uh, you know, like in this from Matthews, uh, where there's a narration of a child who who has a, who is epileptic, and that declaration is made clearly. Often falls into the fire and into the water. Uh, and I looked up the rest uh, of the narrations of, of Caesars, uh, and and they, they really do sound like Caesars. You know, you hear uh, talk about uh, an aura or a, or a scream. Uh, prior to an event which is described, uh, uh, I, I didn't expect it to be described so clearly. Uh, and and uh, so luckily in the Bible, the, the, the few, uh, I think, non-epileptic Caesar episodes uh, that are described, uh, I don't know about the Quran, uh, but um, I think importantly uh, is my message uh, for today. Uh, perhaps you are all sold on it. Uh, but uh, the very big deal here is that uh, for diagnosis of epilepsy in children uh, and young people uh, need to be really made by health workers with appropriate training and expertise in epilepsy. And, and in our setting, uh, it's quite common to see uh, in truth kids being managed by adult neurologists or adult physicians uh, and, and vice versa. And, and that's usually sometimes a recipe for for, for misdiagnosis. Uh, it's important that there is a, a diagnostic reevaluation re to assess difficult cases with the continuing uh, events uh, so that uh, we avoid unnecessary drug treatment and restrictions on a child's lifestyle. Critical. Uh, there are lots of unclassifiable events with no clear uh, uh, epileptic or non epileptic cause, and it is okay to just manage expectantly. So my message here is usually there is no rush. I know there's a lot of pressure upon parents uh, from uh, doctors who've referred kids to you to, to give them a diagnosis and to start, start uh, uh, doing something. Uh, but, but really, if you're not clear on what you're dealing with, a, a condemnation like uh, this poor lady who was brought to Jesus uh, uh, is, is really not the thing to do. You, you need to, to, to wait up and uh, evaluate appropriately and be sure and be clear that you're making a diagnosis, uh, the right diagnosis. Uh, so there, there are a whole host of events. Some are common in different age groups. So you see here, uh, you, you have be, newborns, you of course may see benign uh, sleep myoclonus, you may observe jitrinus and hyperplexia. As they grow older in infancy and childhood, you'll see breathe-holding spells 
self gratification behaviors and other uh, movements uh, or, or mimics of seizures and over to adolescents where uh, psychogenic and anepileptic events uh, get common and you also uh, see migraines and tics and other sleep disorders. Uh, this is really an interesting paper that we will be looking at uh, that, uh, that really uh, reviews and breaks it down very, very well. Uh, I'm uh, at the risk of patronizing you, so my, my, honestly, my apologies if these are things that are very obvious to you. I'm going to share some videos and hopefully just uh, get your thoughts on what you see. Uh, uh, and uh, Gail will be helping me with that. I've got informed consent for all these videos, uh, uh, but uh, I do not have permission to share widely with them. So I'm really requesting you not to uh, record. So I'll start with this. Uh, you tell me what you think, write on, your, on the chat. And uh, Gail, you can tell me what feedback we get. <laughs> okay, uh, what does the team think? What do they see? What do they think is diagnosis? So we've got no no suggestions yet. Can we can we get some suggestions? What do you think of that? Epileptic or not epileptic? Yep. So we're getting not epileptic coming through very strongly. Okay. Great. Um, it, it, any idea of what it could be then? Well, I want to share the next video uh, before I comment on that. Uh, this is the other one. So I'm really interested uh, to, uh, to know why uh, people uh, make the choice they make, whether it's epileptic or non-epileptic. What is it that you see that makes you come to that diagnosis or call? So there are two answers. One is cough is not expected in epileptic uh, yeah. and one psychogenic. And the other one thinks maybe Korea. Mm -hmm. Myoclonic movements. Okay, I give you five more seconds. Uh, body thrashing. Yeah, okay, uh, great. And thank you very much for participating. So uh, in the first case, uh, was an adolescent girl who had previously been treated for temporal lobe epilepsy. Uh, was in control uh, on, on carbamazepin. Uh, and then uh, at about last year, the onset of Corona uh, started uh, having these uh, seizure episodes uh, and was uh, actually uh, admitted into hospital with status epilepticus, or so they said it was. And the doses were escalated and the seizures continued. And obviously when we saw the videos, we thought, okay, now these are not seizures. So uh, these were, were clearly non-epileptic seizures, uh, psychogenic in, 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 a, in, in, in a girl who also has epilepsy. Uh, uh, the second, uh, of course, is a boy. Uh, the movements, again, are, are, are non-epileptic. Uh, but in this case, there was no uh, diagnosis of, of epilepsy alongside uh, the psychogenic events. Uh, he could be called out, uh, uh, and, and uh, I want to bring out a certain characteristic that helps you distinguish between uh, uh, psychogenic and uh, epileptic seizures. Uh, one, uh, in the boy, for instance, you can see, uh, and in the girl too, the, the, the eyes are closed, which is uh, pretty rare in, uh, in, in seizures, where particularly if they're going to be generalized, uh, they may have an onset associated with the staring. 
uh, uh, and then uh, of course they, there was the, the, the mention that cough <laughs> you you know you if you are arousable or unconscious uh, then your reflexes uh, are not working that well for you so cough is pretty weird uh, then the movements are you not know, rhythmic uh, and you can see uh, you know you you have uh, uh, on and off movements of different parts of the body. Uh, and a lot of the psychogenic events will be situational uh, and you don't hear them happening in the absence of a, a crowd or, 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 or individuals to, uh, to witness. Uh, and, and sometimes uh, when the individuals witness, they may either aggravate the events or, uh, or, or uh, ameliorate them. Uh, so clearly somebody playing to, to, to the observations. Uh, is, and, and movements uh, include uh, pelvic thrust, thrusting. Uh, they may have uh, uh, tremors. Uh, you know, uh, if, if and some people actually mimic uh, uh, tonic clonic events pretty well. You you can still have uh, tongue biting in in uh, psychogenic episodes, uh, although there is a distinction that uh, you most likely will have. Uh, uh, the, the tip of the tongue biting in, in psychogenic episodes as opposed to the uh, side of the tongue. Uh, and, and they're usually uh, quite prolonged, uh, among other features that will make you just uh, know, uh, yeah, that you're dealing with a psychogenic event. More common in, in, in girls uh, than boys. One other way that I usually get the history out is uh, essentially to ask the, the child if they if they're able to explain themselves to, to tell me what actually happened. And if they take you through uh, a story that shows they are aware of the event, then you, you know, you're clear about what you're dealing with. So that's that. Um, let's look at this. Okay, so what does the team think? We've got two that are non-epileptic. Okay, uh, what could they be? And what do you see? Uh, ticks. Okay, good. Anybody else? Career. Okay. Mostly ticks. A psychogenic. So uh, yeah, these these are ticks. They do look like uh, myoclonic jacks, uh, uh, but, but of course they, 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 they of course are associated with the big amplitude uh, movement. Uh, but the big deal is that the, the, they can the child may be able to suppress them, uh, and it may just not necessarily be a, a motor. You could also have a verbal manifestation. Uh, for this particular child also had epilepsy. Uh, and uh, initially when we started care, it was difficult for the parents to distinguish what were seizures and what were ticks and what needed to be attended to with anti-epileptic medication and what needed to be disregarded and what kind of support this child needed. Uh, and we had uh, good management of the seizures, the ticks persisted of course, uh, but the child was able to control them uh, was when uh, was anxious or in school, uh, not happening in sleep. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, they lapsed on the anti-epileptic medication and the child uh, suffered a, a, a severe uh, or rather status epilepticus that led that, that proved fatal. Uh, but yeah, uh, very happy with the, with the responses so far. Okay, we we'll move on.
Okay, any thoughts? Epileptic, non epileptic. Okay. Uh, Self gratification, not epileptic. Gratification, gratif a sleeping myoclonia. So everyone says not epileptic. Okay. Um, and mostly gratification. Yeah, and, and, and this is a the self gratification uh, it, it looked pretty obvious when the child was seated, we, we, we lost our video, uh, but of course you have the adduction and staring um, in, in that other video more clearly, uh, uh, and uh, happens again a lot in uh, infants and toddlers, uh, girls in particular, uh, there will usually be a report of it happening uh, uh, when the nap is full or when they're in the car seat uh, uh, and uh, the car seat is rubbing against the genitalia. Uh, parents can be quite distressed about it, uh, uh, but essentially non-epileptic and you just need to reassure them. Um, yeah, so uh, other uh, very, very common, uh, in fact, one of the most common uh, uh, non-epileptic uh, seizures is uh, vasovagal syncope. Usually uh, self-limiting, abrupt loss of consciousness with loss in a uh, postural tone. Uh, that's consistent across when uh, individuals get syncope and usually uh, fall from uh, upright uh, position. Most consistently, the story will be uh, uh, that the onset was an upright position. Uh, speaks to uh, cardiac or neurocardiogenic origin. Uh, patients would uh, could report fading uh, of vision into blackness, and that may be on account of diminished uh, retinol uh, supply, uh, and uh, they will also report dizziness and altered hearing. There's very quick uh, gain in consciousness uh, and uh, uh, a significant uh, <laughs> a proportion of these uh, individuals actually have uh, seizures uh, that could usually uh, you know, confuse you. Uh, the right thing to do is to assess the blood pressure uh, in, in supine uh, and, uh, uh, and, and upright position, looking for differences in uh, systolic and diastolic pressures. Uh, you will do well with a, um, a cardiac assessment. Uh, so that's that. Uh, closely related to these are reflex and oxic seizures. Uh, and you have uh, associated loss of consciousness. It happens in up to 5% uh, of, of kids between the age of six months and five years. Uh, it will usually be provoked by a sudden distress, distressing stimulus that will be associated with uh, uh, maybe pain. Uh, and, and what you could observe is a loss of consciousness, uh, perhaps followed by stiffening and brief chronic movements affecting all limbs, again, looking really uh, uh, like a Caesar and, and actually a Caesar happening in that context. Uh, you have a, 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 a cyanotic uh, and, and pallid spells uh, here. Uh, and uh, uh, I've had uh, two cases within the last uh, one month of individuals who actually started on treatment. Uh, whereas when you uh, listen to the history, uh, then you get uh, a very clear uh, uh, indication of what it is. Uh, it's always good uh, to uh, have a, a cardiac assessment for all these kids uh, with syncope and uh, with anoxic seizures. Uh, so uh, they, it's, it's, it's they're, they're, they're good uh, indicators to help you make this distinction that we've talked we've talked to. Uh, one in uh, in uh, epileptic seizures, you will have uh, an aura uh, that's an aura before a seizure is really uh, pointing towards an epileptic seizure. While with syncope, they may report blackness uh, or, or uh, feeling sweaty. 
uh, and dizziness. Uh, they both may still have convulsions uh, and uh, you can still get urinary incontinence, although it's uh, uh, quite rare in, uh, in syncope. Uh, please take note of that distinction that uh, with syncope, the individuals reorient themselves almost uh, immediately after the event. Then for much uh, younger children, uh, we take note of hyperplexia, which is excessive startle disease. It's an autosomal dominant uh, uh, condition with the exaggerated startle response uh, uh, to unexpected auditory, tactile, visual, or vestibular stimulus, uh, usually related to glycine uh, uh, mediated or uh, uh, neurotransmission defects. Uh, and uh, uh, can be induced by a tapping on the nose or the glabella. Uh, and when you have excessive startle, uh, uh, the thing to do uh, is the vegan vano maneuver, which is uh, uh, demonstrated here uh, with the flexion of the trunk holding onto the neck. Uh, that helps to abolish that. Some uh, people get to treat that if, if, it's, uh, if it's in excess uh, and uh, uh, clonazepam, carbamazepine uh, uh, can be used, but we've rarely seen the need to treat that. There's been uh, literature on uh, acquired hyperplexia related to cerebral malaria. Uh, uh, that also is responsive to treatment, but usually quite benign. There is a host of other things that are non-epileptic, uh, including daydreams. Daydreams are usually uh, situational, uh, as no association with the eyelid flutter, as you may observe maybe with absences, and they are quite uh, uh, prolonged. Benign sleep from our clonus, you will see that uh, you know, jackie movement of, uh, of, 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 of newborns, again, usually just evolves out. There's a whole lot of parasomnias that uh, happens in uh, uh, slow of sleep, uh, ranging from night terrors to somnambulism. Uh, uh, but there you still also get uh, REM-related uh, uh, stuff uh, at, at the point of, of, of arousal. Uh, then we take note of uh, narcolepsy, which uh, will be associated with uh, cataplexy. Uh, excessive or rather uh, daytime sleepiness, uh, fall into sleep, uh, loss of uh, uh, or rather collapse onto themselves, lot of loss of tone is, is, is a key uh, characteristic. Uh, and usually these individuals fall right into uh, REM sleep. Sandifer's syndrome uh, in association with the severe uh, reflux with the uh, arcing of the back uh, uh, also is observed. Uh, you get jitteriness in, in newborns, uh, uh, which uh, have no particular cause, but sometimes may have a, uh, an association with the uh, neurological uh, pathology from encephalopathy to tetanus uh, to uh, uh, other things uh, like, like uh, cerebral palsy that you may want to just uh, uh, investigate for. Uh, the truth is, that uh, a lot of uh, uh, people or individuals or children with neurological disease will also have uh, some of these non-epileptic uh, uh, events. And if you don't listen or elicit them carefully, then you will be chasing the wind in trying to treat what is actually uh, not a seizure uh, and, and, and taking into account the, the very uh, real possibility or, or fact that they may also have uh, um, uh, seizures. I want to share uh, this link. I hope I still have a few minutes. Um, uh, just, just hold on. Be patient. Um, and that's uh, 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 one of the papers I've alluded to. Uh, we have some videos. Uh, uh, this one in particular. Um, I'll play that.
Yeah, uh, so that's uh, hyperplexia, uh, self-limiting in this child, uh, usually uh, uh, not a big deal. Uh, then, um, So jitteriness, uh, again, uh, in a child who has a congenital heart disease, I, um, again, uh, they may be brought to your attention uh, for treatment or management uh, in the context of other uh, challenges in care, then you can see the real possibility that uh, uh, they may be started on treatment. So uh, I'm going to share one last one. Uh, So self-gratification, uh, unfortunately, we are not able to see the face, uh, but you can see a clear uh, adduction uh, uh, and uh, uh, what uh, obviously is a persistent uh, uh, event. Uh, so there, if you get to the link on, 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 on there are, uh, hopefully there'll be a chance to access this lecture. Uh, uh, you then will be able to access some of these videos uh, and uh, appreciate uh, what we are talking about. So here we are. I hope we can still see my screen. Uh, back to my message uh, that uh, I know we are all very experienced, uh, uh, some more than others, uh, but we still uh, or rather what I've observed is we still have challenges sometimes, including myself, and uh, is to just take note that uh, uh, that there may be loads of unclassifiable events with no clear uh, epileptic or non-epileptic cause. Uh, that's common. Uh, uh, don't be under pressure. Uh, does, for as long as it's not uh, life-threatening or a child is clearly not on status, just uh, manage uh, expectantly and decide to, to start treatment uh, when you're clear. Uh, for uh, patients, uh, particularly with background neurological problems with what looks like refractory diseases, reevaluate at all times. Ask yourself whether you are really uh, managing uh, the diseases or there are other additional events uh, that are happening uh, in these children. Uh, that would call for uh, uh, an alternative uh, management. So that's my gospel for today. Uh, I leave you with uh, a, a screen grab of an EEG recording uh, of a, a, a hypnagogic uh, hypersynchrony. Uh, usually, many times, this EEG recording is brandished on our face and declared that, yeah, uh, on account of this, this child had an abnormal uh, seizure, or rather abnormal EEG, uh, and uh, they are started on treatment. This happens a lot. The EEG is used as a basis for uh, starting treatment uh, because of such uh, events or such observations. Thank you very much for your time. Hopefully it's been uh, worth your while. Thank you. Thank you, Sam, for, for an outstanding presentation and, and uh, a really good overview of epileptic and non-epileptic paroxysmal events. We both, uh, so while we're waiting for some questions to come in, 
Um, we both, and uh, please can you just put it into the question and answer as many people as possible to, um, ask questions. We both come from underserved settings and are poorly resourced. We get children that come in and we're really not sure. I know we can wait, but how do you investigate these children? What do you do? So um, I, I hear you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, uh, and, and in, in our situation, we actually even get referrals from other uh, distant towns. Uh, and and uh, you're very clear that if you don't give a definite direction, there'll be lost follow up and uh, maybe the uh, ill uh, or uh, inappropriate management will continue. Uh, what I have found useful, one, is to request for videos. Uh, you know, pictures speak a thousand words, videos speak a million words, and uh, a lot of things that uh, may have been described as Caesars when you actually see them are not. Uh, two is uh, to uh, create liaisons with the, uh, with the, the, the health workers, uh, maybe junior to you uh, in those uh, distant areas to work together to uh, farm up uh, a diagnosis. Uh, I uh, for as long as I'm not worried that uh, the child is, uh, uh, is, 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 is not going to suffer any life-threatening events, uh, then, and, and we can work together with the distant uh, health worker to, uh, to support, just in case there are concerns about that, then uh, it usually works for us well. Uh, I also discourage investigations uh, prior to uh, uh, at least uh, prior to my review, and, and those investigations are really just uh, uh, EEGs and imaging until we have an assessment for the simple reason that a lot of times when the EEG is done and it's declared to be abnormal and the parents uh, are aware of this, it's very hard to take away that uh, impression that they have, yes, there was something that was found to be abnormal and you're telling us it means nothing, because in truth, uh, lots of things are actually not abnormal. Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know what your setting is like, but uh, it's been misused uh, in, in, in a number of circumstances to make such declarations. So that would be my two pens on that. I totally agree with you that the um, EEG is overused and abused. Um, and unfortunately, we have a lot of patients referred into us already with an EEG that has got these non-specific abnormalities and, and the parents uh, have already seen the, the, the report. You talk about neuroimaging as well. What neuroimaging do you have available and what do you recommend? Well, uh, so obviously, if, if it's clear uh, that it's probably epileptic, then of course the International League Against Epilepsy recommends uh, uh, MRI brain imaging as the, uh, the, the imaging of choice. And uh, that essentially uh, takes into consideration the fact that uh, MRI is much better at showing uh, abnormalities of brain parenchyma uh, than uh, CT scan. Uh, but again, uh, the truth is uh, a lot of uh, patients will already come uh, to us uh, already scanned uh, and that's a CT scan uh, and you will see some uh, not so clear uh, uh, observations uh, uh, but declared to be abnormal that then um, and, and in the context of uh, resource uh, uh, challenges then you know, you're really in a fix on whether uh, you can actually send them back for uh, an MRI. And, and the price difference uh, is, is such that it, they may as well just go for the MRI from the word go. Uh, right now, there's a proliferation of uh, MRI uh, imaging centers in, in Nairobi uh, and uh, in uh, the major towns in Kenya. Uh, I don't know what the situation is for the rest of uh, the team, but. Uh, uh, hopefully, with time, we'll have uh, better reporting uh, and, and more uh, or better utilization of that resource. Thank you. I agree with your answer. Um, if questions just come in. Um, when do you consider GLUT1 deficiency? 
in paroxysmal events? So I, one is a, obviously that's a whole <laughs> topic altogether. Uh, and it involves uh, engaging on uh, early uh, seasons or early uh, epilepsies. Uh, and we know uh, that uh, uh, for such observations, there's usually a, a close relationship with, uh, with feeding or replenishing of, of, of sugar. Uh, for some cases, you, you, may, you may see uh, such stark uh, uh, relationships uh, right from uh, uh, the onset. Uh, but uh, for non-epileptic events, I would uh, uh, essentially um, guide against over-investigation of, 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 uh, uh, of these children. Um, is a 24-hour EEG monitoring mandatory or not? It's not mandatory. Uh, it may be helpful, uh, and, and uh, uh, considering a video EEG is not a resource that we easily uh, we we have easy access to. I think you want to use that judiciously. It may be helpful when there is doubt uh, uh, about uh, what you are observing because. Uh, the events that really look uh, like seizures, uh, sound like seizures, and uh, or rather epileptic seizures, and you just want to be clear on what the relationship is with the uh, EEG uh, activity. Uh, but I will say it's not mandatory. Sam, in your value, what is uh, what is the uh, in your opinion, what is the value of a twenty-minute EEG? Oh goodness! Uh, <laughs> again. Um, Quite, uh, uh, quite a subject indeed. Uh, so outside just uh, 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 diagnosis of non-epileptic events uh, uh, in, in uh, management of uh, individuals with uh, what sounds uh, uh, like uh, uh, seizures. Uh, one, the, we know for a fact that uh, EEGs, uh, particularly such routine short EEGs should not be used to firm up diagnosis because there is significant occurrence of abnormalities in uh, non on children without epilepsy. And uh, the significant uh, observations of uh, normal EEG in individuals with epilepsy. So uh, uh, an, an a routine EEG is essentially complementary to a proper um, a clinical assessment. So uh, all that uh, is used uh, uh, together. So uh, I'm not quite sure I'm able to, to give you a, a, a very clear answer on that, but uh, with certainty, uh, it helps to have a proper clinical assessment. Uh, EEG complements when you, when, for instance, when, when, when all the signs lead uh, or suggest uh, uh, an epileptic seizure, uh, you want to uh, confirm uh, onset uh, characteristic to help you make a, a syndromic diagnosis to help you relate the observations uh, with uh, what's happening. But 20 minutes is a pretty short time. So uh, all that uh, has to be in the context of your clinical assessment. Thank you. Are there any more questions? There's nothing else in the question and answer session. Uh, no more questions. Uh, I think. Um, other than to say um, thank you very much and thank you for an outstanding presentation that comes from not me, but from me as well. Um, really, we appreciate your talk and, and the time that you've taken and uh, we've learned a lot from you. Thank you. Um, and that would. Uh, no, just lots of thank yous coming through. Um, so th thank you once again. And that now concludes the first of the ILEA Mediterranean and Africa co uh, collaboration of, of these webinars. Um, and we look forward to many more. Thank you, Sam. And thank you to the organizers. Thank you, everyone.